Hi, everyone. We will uh, give just a couple of uh, minutes for people to trickle in and then we will get started. Fantastic. Fantastic. Touches with you. All right. We may have some people trickle in still, but we will go ahead and get started. Um, hello, everyone, and welcome to Birth Control Bedfellows, a discussion with unsung heroes for better contraceptive access, an event from the R Street Institute. My name is Courtney Joslin, and I am a resident fellow in competition policy at R Street, where I focus my work on birth control disintermediation and telehealth policy. If you're unfamiliar with R Street, we are a nonprofit, nonpartisan public policy research organization that conducts policy research supporting free markets and limited but effective government. You may wonder, as many do, why a think tank that believes in limited government and free markets specifically promotes better contraceptive access through policy reform. But it is because of these principles that we do this work. Uh, many efforts to increase birth control access uh, these days are deregulatory in nature. For example, making birth control pills available over the counter would mean fewer hoops that are currently in place due to regulation for people to jump through to get their routine contraceptives, less government involvement in an individual's ability to obtain contraception, and overall better selection for the consumer. From a right of center perspective, what's not to love? Historically, the voices that have been the loudest for better birth control access are those on the political left. Many of these voices were critical in securing contraceptive access for women in the first place in the US, but we do tend to forget the so-called unsung heroes that also supported these reforms. In fact, you may not know that George H.W. Bush was once nicknamed Rubbers while in Congress for his Republican support of family planning access. And so today I have the honor of talking with some modern unsung heroes for better birth control access that have made strides in reforming contraceptive access for the better. So joining me today is Aaron Pilkington, who is a Republican member of the Arkansas House of Representatives. He has been in this position since 2016 and has championed a number of innovative healthcare reforms in the state of Arkansas, including contraception. And Aaron is also a healthcare administrator. Also with us is Teresa Bukovinak, the co-leader of Secular Pro-Life, and she is a self-described feminist, Democrat, and consistent life advocate. Teresa has been involved in pro-life outreach among a number of organizations throughout California, and her efforts have been featured in outlets like NBC News, Huffington Post, San Francisco Chronicle, and NPR. We also have Hadley Heath Manning with us, who is the Director of Policy for the Independent Women's Forum. Hadley contributes policy work on healthcare, entitlements, and economic policy, and she regularly appears on outlets like Fox Business and Fox News, as well as appears in outlets like the Wall Street Journal, Forbes, and Politico. Thank you all so much for joining us today. Uh, one reminder for uh, everyone joining us, if you have a question that comes up during the discussion, please enter it into the chat. I will keep about 15 minutes at the end for me to ask our panelists the questions. And with that, we will get started. All right, Aaron, I want to start with you. <clears throat> you are a self-proclaimed Catholic, conservative, and Republican, but you're also an Arkansas state legislator who championed a bill to allow pharmacists to prescribe birth control in Arkansas, which was recently signed into law. Congrats, by the way. Um, how do your conservative and Republican principles tie into your efforts to increase birth control access and why did you decide to spearhead this particular change in Arkansas? Sure. So to me, like you said in your intro, there's a lot of things that just make sense. You know, we're talking about things we want to do, which is which is deregulate health care to expand access to health care. Um, you know, not to mention there's a significant amount of economic savings. You know, when we look at how much we spend on Medicaid babies um, in the state, I think we said that, you know, if we pass this bill, um, 
we were going to see about, uh, I want to say about a $32 million savings when it came to overall birth in a 10 year span. So that's a pretty significant amount of savings to the state and for taxpayers. So there's a conservative fiscal kind of Republican view. You can take of it. There's the deregulation part as well. Um, but of course, too, you know, I mean, we talk about personal responsibility. We talk about uh, things like that. And, and to me, that's, you know, how can we say that we want people to have personal responsibility and then we don't give them the tools to make responsible choices. And so to me, I think it's it's very consistent with what we believe in. But of course, there's the social conservative part of it that, you know, like you've mentioned in the past, historically, we haven't been in favor of, of contraceptives. So um, that's something that changes. You know, I think we uh, have a lot more uh, kind of social mo moderates in the party too. I mean, I would call myself a social conservative. Um, you know, I'm pro-life and, and like you mentioned, I'm, I'm Catholic and, uh, and all those things really contribute into, into who I am, what I believe. But to me, you know, I thought this was good pro-life policy because it does reduce the amount of abortions in a state. Uh, and that's what I, I told a lot of my colleagues because look, we, I'm a big rubber meets the road kind of guy. You know, I don't want to just do it for headlines. I want something that actually works. And this is something that we've actually seen has worked. And so, you know, even and, you know, as a Catholic, I had a lot of trouble um, with this because I do follow the church teachings and I, I believe in, in their stance. But, you know, when I was talking to some of them, I said, what's, you know, what's worse? I mean, what, what would we rather happen? Would we rather have a reduction in abortion by increasing access to contraceptives? Or would we rather keep access to contraceptives low and see an increase in abortions in the state? And that's, a, you know, for a lot of them, I am you know, I don't see the church endorsing this, but I, I think for a lot of them, it made them, you know, see that where I was coming from was in earnest of trying to, to reduce these abortions in the state. So, um, so there's that. And, and, you know, I think we've got a lot of good people in the, in the House and the Senate who ultimately saw that this is good for thinking policy. And that kind of leads me into my question for Teresa. Um, uh, who, as I mentioned, her organization is Secular Pro-Life, and they are in favor of contraceptive use, but they also recognize that many in the pro-life movement aren't as supportive of this access. Uh, so, Teresa, why does your organization support the use of birth control, and do you see this attitude toward birth control changing among pro-life individuals and groups uh, sort of as we progress in this conversation, and, you know, yes or no with that, or maybe, or all of the above? Uh, well, it is a really sensitive topic within the pro-life movement, and Secular Pro-Life is run by three atheist women, um, Kelsey, who is an independent, Monica, who is a conservative, and me, who is a flaming liberal. Um, so we are definitely working across the political aisle and trying to always find common ground with our followers um, and presenting the anti-abortion position from a secular point of view. Um, and, but like you said, like we really do have to address first and foremost what those concerns are coming from the pro-life movement because we obviously don't have a lot of allies out there except in the pro-life movement and they're widely opposed to contraception. So, and I think that there is a, and I, I there's a distinction between the pro-life movement and gen, the general population who identifies as pro-life um, because what we see in statistics is that the general population is quite supportive of increased access to contraception. Um, but there's a, there's a cultural attitude about um, birth control within the pro-life movement that we see um, that can make things complicated. But I also think a lot of people look at that and they say, oh, you know, that's just their religious position, but it is a little bit more complicated than that. Um, pro-lifers are concerned that increased access to contraception could actually increase the abortion rate um, because it increase um, the people's interest in engaging in se uh, risky sexual behavior uh, they're also concerned about some of the medical side effects um, of horm hormonal birth control, especially. And, um, and they have some other concerns as well, like that it may or may not cause abortions. So those are kind of the hurdles that we have to get over as a pro-life organization in order to um, advocate for contraception. But one of the reasons that we do is because we agree that even if there is, um, you know, some correlation between increased um, contraception and riskier sexual behavior, we also see a correlation between increased contraception and um, anti-abortion laws. So there's, there's a potential that they're affecting each other, that as you increase contraception, that you're preparing a community for increased restrictions 
on abortion. And we also acknowledge that in any given sexual scenario, it certainly makes sense that you're going to decrease the chances of an unintended pregnancy uh, if you use contraception. And um, of course, we really do not think that there is enough evidence out there to really say that abortion, or I'm sorry, that um, contraception causes an abortion. And, and this idea comes from the, the reality that some birth control can thin the lining of the uterus. Um, but what we seem to see in the science is that if, if um, conception does occur, that the uterus does thicken anyways, that that mechanism to thin the lining doesn't act in that way that we know of. But we do have to acknowledge that if it, if it turns out that it actually does, because the science isn't totally clear, on the issue, you know, that we do have a position of life at conception and, and we wouldn't support it in that way. Um, but all of the evidence that we have today suggests that that is not really the case. And that, and the, the most major benefit to the pro-life movement by deregulating birth control is to take money away from the abortion industry. And people tell me all the time, Teresa, there is no such thing as the abortion industry, but we know there is an industry for everything. There's a pharmaceutical industry. There's certainly an abortion industry. And the abortion industry is not only making a ton of money off of their, off of um, contraception and getting taxpayer funding for that and being able to expand their abortion services and, and promoting abortion. Um, so that is a, that is the biggest benefit that we really see um, to deregulating birth control and, and the cultural aspect. It, it's really important that, um, that we are showing that there is a distinction between how we feel about abortion, killing a, a living human, human being, obviously that's how we see it, um, and preventing contraception from happening. This cultural distinction has to happen um, and it, it really starts in the states and it starts, you know, from our leadership, like legislators like Aaron. So I, I really, really appreciate everything that you're doing. And, um, you know, we we're with you and, and we really hope to see a future where it, each individual can make this choice for themselves and that we're taking this power away from the abortion industry and that we're preventing young girls from beginning their sexual lives with by consulting with an abortion provider. If it's, I mean, if, imagine if it was crisis pregnancy centers, for example, that were offering birth control access. And I know that this is kind of a non-starter at this point, but I think that if we got there, that means that it's pro-life organizations that would have that first contact with these individuals when they begin having sex. And instead of like this organization that ultimately is really hoping that they're gonna come back to them so they can sell them an abortion. So we're hoping for a better world and we think that this is certainly a step in the right direction. And they say no one wants to reach across the political aisle anymore, but there you have it folks right there. <laughs> Birth control, who knew, is uniting people. Um, so that brings me to Hadley. Hadley, I wanted to ask you a question as well. So uh, the Independent Women's Forum believes that the healthcare uh, system in the U.S. lacks a competitive, transparent, patient-centered marketplace, which contributes to the high prices and lack of access that we see across many facets of our healthcare system. So could you expand on what this means? I think a lot of people um, who don't work in this in this area may not know what that means um, and, and how this has affected birth control access in the past. Sure. Uh, well, one way to look at our healthcare system is uh, through the lens of who makes the decisions, right? And I would sort of challenge most Americans, you know, what decisions are you making? If you're choosing your doctors or your treatments, you're probably choosing within a network that has been chosen for you by your insurance plan. And if you're choosing an insurance plan, you're probably accepting the choice that your employer has made for you. The vast majority of employers who offer insurance plans offer one plan, or maybe you're choosing among a very small list of plans offered to you by your employer, or you're choosing on an ACA exchange that has a limited number of options in terms of insurance companies or plans that are competing there. So as Americans, we're really not making as patients that many choices when it comes to our own health care. We're, you know, we're not choosing just any doctor or just any insurance plan. We're generally, if you're privately insured, most people get their insurance through an employer. And so we've got a very limited um, set of choices. This is a huge 
distortion in the marketplace for healthcare. Um, and it sort of flies in the face of this description of American healthcare as free market. I would say we do not have a free market for healthcare. We have a very distorted quasi-public, quasi-private healthcare system. And when it comes to birth control, I mean, it's a great example of this payment pipeline um, that involves, in many cases, individuals who pay insurance premiums, employers who pay insurance premiums, insurance companies who pay drug makers, um, and pharmacies that pay for the drugs that they sell. So we've got this whole web of um, dollars that are exchanging hands that makes for a very convoluted and inefficient payment pipeline that adds to the costs. And although this is, you know, we're talking about birth control access, we can't deny that access and affordability are really tied. And I think this is where IWF comes to this issue, maybe from a different place uh, than the other panelists, Aaron and Teresa. We don't take a position on abortion. We don't take a position on the morality of birth control, um, but we do see this as an economic issue and we want women to be empowered as consumers and as patients. And we've seen with other drugs that have moved um, into over-the-counter status that their price actually drops dramatically. And so if we want to make birth control more accessible for all women or all consumers, then one of the best ways to do that would be to expose the drugs to price competition and the price sensitivity that comes with buying drugs over the counter. So that's, that's one way to see this issue that's maybe a slightly different angle, um, but certainly there's, um, there's the hurdles that we make women jump through to get the prescription. Uh, there's additional costs that come with securing the doctor's visit. And there are, I get it, healthcare related concerns, medical concerns um, that people have with the specific drugs. And this is where I'd encourage people to check out the stance of the American College of Obstetricians and Gynecologists, ACOG. They actually are in favor of over-the-counter birth control because they recognize that when it comes to screening for contraindications, women are very good at doing this as individuals. And it's not necessarily the case that they need to be counseled by a doctor. Some counseling might be good. You might have a pharmacist who could counsel um, even for over-the-counter drugs. There are certainly ways to, to write policy like that. There's ways to write policy that would keep the no copay option uh, that was a part of the Affordable Care Act and move birth controls, many uh, hormonal oral birth controls to over-the-counter status without undoing that piece of Obamacare. Um, so I, Personally, I'd like to see that piece of Obamacare uh, changed because it does contribute to a higher cost. Uh, this is the last thing that I'll say about this. When you do look at the no copay piece of Obamacare, and to be clear, I'm talking about the mandates in the Affordable Care Act that required every insurance plan to cover all birth controls from the first dollar. And you look at the impact that that has had on the price of birth control. Of course, people who take advantage of that coverage feel that they are paying zero dollars at the point of consumption. They are paying zero dollars at the point of consumption, but the actual price of birth control has increased dramatically. It was falling previous to this mandate, and then it started to increase because of the inefficiency of paying for birth control that way and the changes that that makes to supply and demand. Um, so if we really want birth control to be more affordable, we would actually change that mandate and we would allow women to buy birth control over the counter. And to your point, Hadley, which is really interesting about choice, whether or not you were actually making decisions, something that came to mind for me was in birth control, the way the various oh methods are regulated uh, impacts an individual's choice on whether or not they will obtain it, right? So for hormonal methods, which are more effective than uh, other methods. Um, if it's harder to obtain, that can skew the decision toward less effective methods um, because it's just more costly to obtain overall, as you said, going to a doctor and that sort of thing. So we really see in this case how the regulation actually does increase the overall cost to a consumer to get that method and they may just not be able to afford that. And so then they're either left with uh, the less effective methods, uh, which of course exposes them to some other issues. So. I thought that was an interesting point. One more point is that, you know, if you're someone who doesn't have insurance, or if you're someone who maybe you're a young woman under the age of 26 and you're using your parents' insurance and you'd prefer not to use that insurance coverage because of a privacy issue, then you're paying out of pocket for birth control anyway. 
And so it's really those women that we're doing the greatest disservice to by increasing the cost of birth control through the no copay mandate. But that's just adding to your point there, Courtney. Yeah, absolutely. So actually I want to uh, talk with Hadley and Aaron about this because of your unique backgrounds in this. So something that we've talked about a lot at R Street internally is how uh, healthcare is a unique policy issue because both Republicans and Democrats believe that the healthcare system is in desperate need of reforms. Um, but of course their proposals for doing so are pretty different. But what they do agree on is that it's kind of a mess. And so uh, do you agree that there is this sort of hard uh, sort of political divide on some of these solutions? Um, are there common ground efforts that you see or maybe ideals or principles between the two parties that they can uh, uh, go forward on? And is birth control within this um, uniting or dividing in the long run politically? Um, because I think this has sort of shifted throughout time, right? As we've gone on when it comes to birth control. Do you want me to go first? <laughs> go ahead, Aaron. Okay. Um, well, I think, you know, the thing with innovations in healthcare, that's a really great fertile ground for um, working in a bipartisan fashion. Because what I've noticed, especially like on telehealth legislation I've done, behavioral health legislation I've done, um, a lot of times the fields are, are new and we're, we're trying to, to catch up to the marketplace. And so the issues haven't been polarized yet. And so there's a lot more kind of open discussion, you know, I think, you know, Democrats may really care about the expansion of access where, you know, Republicans are more interested in the, um, you know, financial savings that come along with those innovations. And, and so I think, you know, as more innovation occurs in healthcare, the more bipartisanship you see, it's really to me just the traditional things about our healthcare system that we really have a big divide on, you know, Medicaid, things like that, um, you know, uh, certificate of need laws, um, but, you know, I, I think there's a lot more common ground than people give it credit for, um, because I think, you know, there's, and especially among like younger legislators, I think there's definitely a desire to see something be done about the system because we obviously know it's bloated. We know it's not working, um, but it's, it's kind of finding the solutions. And I always say, you know, probably 90% of the policy we deal with is not partisan in nature. And we just need to focus on that and let the 10% that is partisan, like let's have those fights, but um, let's not let it, let it spill into the other parts of, of policy changes that we, that we need to make. And, um, you know, a, a great example of one is I worked on with a, a Democrat friend of mine about making sure that we're getting uh, mammogram screenings for, um, for women in prison because we're not catching it early enough. And then the state's paying massive amounts for, um, for, for cancer treatments. Well, you know, there's the Republicans liked it because they fiscally were saving money to the state. And then of course, Democrats liked it because we were taking care of prisoners and that was very close to their heart and, and some of the, some of the issues that, that they really care about in this, in Arkansas. So there, you know, there's things like that, you know? Um, and so I think, you know, I, I think there is room to, to really grow and change and, and, and to work in more bipartisan fashion. I think that birth control is a very instructive uh, policy piece in terms of looking for the common ground solutions. When the Affordable Care Act mandate um, came out, people may remember that uh, there were many lawsuits that followed, including the one involving Hobby Lobby and the Green family. Uh, they take a position, a, a moral, you know, religious position against certain types of birth control. They didn't want to pay for the coverage for their employees. And this went all the way to the Supreme Court. I wrote about this for US News and World Report. And I think the title of my article was something like, none of your boss's business. And this is, I think, a message that can appeal to people on both sides of the aisle. People on the left, especially women, understand that we don't want our privacy to be offended by uh, an employer who might have a different moral position on birth control than we do individually. But the problem is that our health insurance system is very employer centric. And people on the right and left see how this is a problem. You know, that's why many people on the right want to move to a more individualized, personalized, portable type of free marketplace for health insurance, 
people on the left want to get away from the employer centric nature of our health insurance system by having a sort of government focused insurance plan or a public insurance plan, right? But we can agree on what we don't like. We don't like people having to be subject to the choices of other people. Um, unfortunately, other people are who run the government, <laughs> right? So I think we're, we're best moving towards a, a more marketplace focused um, type of healthcare system where we have more uh, affordability and competitiveness. I, I will say that maybe the common ground solution looks something like um, government subsidization where people are offered a uh, refundable tax credit or some kind of uh, financial support for their medical costs or for their health insurance costs. And to a degree, the Affordable Care Act, you know, dabbles in this with the um, sort of sliding scale tax credits um, that get kind of complicated and that um, were recently expanded to people um, that even higher incomes. But I think you could design a system like that that would appeal more to people on the right, if it were a flatter tax credit, or if it were um, the case that we could use, for example, a health savings account to pay for health insurance premiums. Um, so I think that there are solutions out there that could be appealing to people on the right and the left. Unfortunately, healthcare has become such a political football that it's something I'm afraid that either side would rather use to beat up people on the opposite side of the aisle than to actually make progress on good policy. Um, and sometimes good policy has natural political opposition because while many people see the problem with the distortion caused by employer-centric health insurance, we have employer-sponsored health insurance and we benefit from that. And so we don't want to, to give that up. It's a very regressive system though. And I would hope that people who are more politically progressive would recognize that and would want to, to change or eliminate that distortion. Yeah, it makes a lot of sense. Um, Teresa, I wanna to turn to you quickly. Uh, so at our street, we say that we will work with mostly anyone to champion reforms that we believe in. Um, and while we are right of center, that means when it comes to birth control, we work with a lot of groups on the left on this issue. Um, and at Secular Pro-Life, you've no doubt run into some interesting uh, bedfellows when it comes to uh, supporting pro-life measures or even pro-birth control efforts. Uh, so do you find that there is a political divide? I think I'm going to know your answer, but um, do you find there's a political divide uh, among people who will or won't work with you on some of these reforms? Um Funny that you ask, uh, we actually have never had the opportunity to ally with someone on this issue before. I mean, this is a very stigmatized issue within groups with which we can ally. And so, you know, this is a really big opportunity. I think that we, as, you know, secular leaders in the movement know that, that the pro-life movement in general needs more representation in terms of birth control access because the vast majority of people who identify as pro-life do support that. Um, so I think that we really haven't had the opportunity to get a lot of pushback on that because we haven't had opportunities to ally. And so this is a this is really exciting. You know, we want to set the example. We want to be the change. We want to show we, you know, I've spent my career pushing back on the narrative that being pro-life means being anti-sex and being like anti-feminist and being against birth control. And you know, I think that, you know, while a lot of people do hold that opinion in the pro-life movement, it cannot be synonymous with being pro-life. Um, so, you know, I wish that I had more examples of that, especially as it relates to birth control access. Um, but this is probably the first example. And I think that it's a great first step. And this is going, there are pro-life people out, right, out there watching this right now that are going to see me and they are going to feel emboldened to also um, step out of the shadows and make it known that they are pro-life and that they do not oppose deregulation of birth control. And that's what's really ultimately going to make a difference. So thank you for giving me this opportunity to be such a strange bedfellow. I'm happy to take it. We, we kind of uh, take a special delight in sort of uniting strange bedfellows uh, as we are often seen as one. So uh, we're very happy that we can have you all talking about this. And that's something that you brought up, Teresa, that made me think of is um, it seems like 
we kind of get, it's kind of, I always think of that saying, like, if you just go outside and talk to someone, you'll find that the world isn't as divided as you think it is. And that's so true in the birth control um, work, right? We see so many people that do support it, but who may have felt like, well, I'm, that's not a uh, partisan issue for me, or, you know, I would get trampled if I tried to champion something like that. Um, even though people sort of understand the sort of common sense aspect of all of this. So it's just, it's an interesting to see um, as we kind of move, you know, into even this new presidential era, right, to see kind of how attitudes towards these things will change. So I want to open kind of the floor a little bit to all three of you to uh, ask you a few questions, uh, some that um, I think are fun. Uh, so first off, I want to ask, as I said, strange bedfellows, people don't often expect this from people on the right or pro-life groups. Have you ever come across sort of a skepticism of uh, any of you or your organizations for supporting better birth control access, um, at, you know, at, as you've done this in your work? I'm curious. Yes, uh, I'm, I'm happy to answer. Um, Secular Pro-Life has received a ton of pushback about our position on birth control. It's been a very stigmatizing issue for us over the years, but I think that people have really gotten used to it, to some, which is excellent news. And we have other organizations now that take much more neutral approach to birth control, which is definitely a step forward. Like Pro-Life San Francisco, the organization I founded, we take a neutral approach to birth control, and that has we're one of the most successful um, local, locally organized pro-life efforts in the nation right now. And we are totally open, you know, to all points of view on birth control. That's a big step. Um, and they're all like Democrats for Life of America also remains neutral on this issue. Um, whereas I think, you know, years ago, that would have been a very scary position to take. So I know it seems like baby steps, but, um, you know, there, there has been a lot of pushback, but we're not giving up. And we're seeing more and more um, neutrality on the issue, which I think is a really good sign. You know, Courtney, one thing that I think is interesting is uh, there's something cultural, maybe due to the pandemic, where so many of our choices, especially as they relate to health, seem so morally fraught. And um, people, I think, often get the impression that if you're in favor of someone else's freedom, to do something, then you're in favor of the thing itself. And that's not necessarily the case. You know, you can be in favor of someone else having the free choice to do something, even something that you might not support personally or morally. And just on kind of a, a funny note, I do think that people become more skeptical of my support for access to birth control every time I have a baby. <laughs> I've just had my third baby in like five years, pretty rapid fire uh, family here. And, um, you know, there's just, I've, I've made my personal choices and that doesn't mean that I, you know, have the desire to restrict someone else's personal choices. I mean, of course there's a limit to this. We don't want to um, allow people to murder other people in the street. We do have laws that protect the individual liberty and life of other people. And that's, I think, where the, the debate over pro-life and pro-choice gets really heated. But at least when it comes to choices about health care, um, there's, there's a lot of room for freedom. The one piece that I would emphasize, and if anybody takes anything away from anything that I say today, it's that personal freedom and personal responsibility are inseparable. They go together, they're linked. And so if we want people to have freedom, if we want them to have freedom over their birth control, for example, then we also have to give them the responsibility when it comes to healthcare or anything else. The person ultimately who pays the bill is the person who's in charge. And so this is where the affordability piece comes in. We want people to have access to something. We want it to be affordable. We want them to have the freedom, but that means they have to have some responsibility. And so to, to a certain degree, I'm echoing what Teresa said. Um, but I don't really feel like I get a lot of personal pushback on my position. I did get in a back and forth one time with Planned Parenthood over their position on birth control. Um, and you can read about that in Forbes. We had a little um, warring columns in, in Forbes between me and Planned Parenthood. Um, but I do think if we just remember that freedom and responsibility are tied, that can guide us through a lot of policy decisions. Well, you're a hero to the pro-life movement just for battling with Planned Parenthood. <laughs> <laughs> I like FDR's quote. He says, I ask you to judge me by the enemies I have made. <laughs> <laughs> 
Love that. <laughs> so kind of, um, kind of a wild question that I just think is fun to discuss uh, because I feel like if this were uh, non-pandemic times, what this would normally be is us having a happy hour discussing this next question, which was um, in, in your view, in five years, what do you think American healthcare access will look like? And within that, what do you think birth control access will look like? Like no, not at all speculative, and we won't hold you to your answers in five years if you turn out to be wrong. <laughs> well, let's see. I, I mean, I would like to believe, you know, my vision for, for contraception access at crisis pregnancy centers would be a thing in a perfect world. I think that that just, you know, you know, we can offer that alongside other types of contraception that pro-lifers are more comfortable with, generally speaking, like natural family planning and, you know, condoms and other types of birth control, but along with hormonal birth control access. I just think that would be so critical to really changing our culture, to really showing girls when they begin their sexual lives, that they have support, that there's a there's a, net, a life affirming network around them, um, rather than just you know an abortion facility, and that's the only place they can go to really talk about you know what's going on with them sexually. Uh, we have to end that dynamic if we're ever going to address abortion in this country, and I think that we're getting closer and closer to that reality. I don't know if it will happen in five years, but I think, you know, there is at least one crisis pregnancy center in the United States right now that does offer birth control. I think it's called the source. And, um, and the more people that I talk to about it in go and in other major cities, even, you know, devout Catholics, they do see the value in separating the issues of abortion and contraception. And they certainly can see the value in, developing some kind of program like that. So that's my dream. Um, but outside of that, I don't have a lot of foresight on what things might actually look like. Yeah, you know, the way I kind of see it in five years, I mean, my hope is you get birth control out of a vending machine. Um, <laughs> you know, I think I think the more that we can, we can deregulate some of our pharmaceuticals that we know are not, um, you know, to be honest, aren't as dangerous as we first maybe suspected. Um, um, I think it's better because like you mentioned, we always see the prices drop when they go over the counter. And obviously, pharmaceutical costs are such a big part of, um, of healthcare. But you know, to me, I think what's interesting, and, and I think as I see healthcare going is, I think we're going to see larger expansion of authorities of mid-levels, not just MDs. And I think we basically will create, you know, different scale models of uh, of how much healthcare you need and who you see and, and, and we can fill the gaps in rural America, which I think is, you know, obviously we have a lot of underserved areas, which the way the current financial system works and healthcare, it just doesn't make sense. But what we're doing is expanding the roles of mid-level so that we can help fill those gaps. And I think when we start filling those gaps, we'll see an overall decrease. So, you know, to me, I think in five years, what we'll see is a, maybe the replacement of the small town doc, but the emergence of the small town APRN. And so um, I'm really excited about that because I think um, that's a great way to get people taken care of with a cheaper cost because, you know, you can pay an APRN in Arkansas 85000 a year where to get that same MD, you're going to have to pay 300000 So, you know, better bang for your buck and sometimes maybe even a little bit better care. <laughs> They're a little more gentle. <laughs> um, yeah, I'm married to an MD. I think he's pretty gentle, but... <laughs> <laughs> That's a happy hour conversation. Let me tell you what I think about the future of the healthcare system. I do think I've got some pessimism and then I've got maybe a little bit of optimism. And my pessimism is mostly um, related to the direction that I see health insurance policy going. And I mean, the reality is in the US we pay for the vast majority of healthcare through health insurance. And uh, so health insurance companies are very powerful. Um, but they aren't very competitive. In fact, we've seen a lot of consolidation in the health insurance industry, fewer, smaller insurers, more, you know, business going to the big insurance companies that have so much control over our healthcare system. And to combat this, we see people on the left proposing um, to compete and increase competition 
with a public option, with a public health insurance plan. And I don't think this is gonna be easy to do at the federal level. I think there's still a lot of resistance to that, um, less and less as we see, you know, sort of the Overton window moving left with proposals like Medicare for all gaining traction and so forth. But I do think that there are uh, several live bills in different states right now to establish public options at the state level. There's a pilot program that's live in Washington state. I think 19 counties you can enroll in a public health insurance plan um, through the state's exchange. So I see that sort of as the direction that we're going in terms of health insurance policy. And the pessimism that I have about that is that government competition doesn't work the same way that private competition works. The government is not subject to the same restrictions, regulations, and taxes that private companies are subject to. And so in a lot of ways, it's an unlevel playing field. And if you have uh, for example, a subsidized public option that pulls a lot of business away from private health insurance plans, then you have, um, I, I believe, a loss of competition, not more competition, but less because some private insurance companies will exit the market if they're not able to maintain their market share. And so I'm afraid that a public option ultimately becomes the only option. It drives the private options out of the market. And then consumers or patients, individuals, have even less power and less choice than they had before. And it's really a slow path to a single payer healthcare system. Now, I promised I would offer a little optimism too. And the optimism is I think that as we see less and less competition, more consolidation, more restriction of individual choice in healthcare, we also see more innovation. I think innovation is, you know, the child of necessity. Necessity is the mother of invention, right? And so you see um, people even today trying to come up with innovative payment models in healthcare that are more global to caring for the whole patient, that are more focused on keeping people healthy rather than caring for them when they're at the most sick, where we've caught their disease at the very last stages. It's very expensive. There's revolving door, you know, social problems and our hospitals where people are moving in and out of substance abuse and homelessness and a variety of, of social ills. So if we can address some of those problems, um, that's not only going to be more fiscally responsible and beneficial, but I think it's also more humane and it's better for us as, as a culture, as a people, as a population. And so I'm hopeful that we'll see some innovations that get us outside of this model that's really broken where we're all paying for everything through health insurance to the point that health insurance isn't really insurance anymore. It's just a payment plan. It's just a pool of dollars and it's more or less a government controlled system even if it's today not completely government funded. And I think kind of to tie your comments together, what I have seen that makes me somewhat optimistic is that we seem to now be at a point, uh, unfortunately, where the healthcare system is so broken and COVID is really shining a light on that, that we are looking more to upstream solutions is kind of what I've been referring them to, right? So Hadley, kind of to what you were talking about, more of a holistic approach to taking care of a patient. Um, I've, I also heard this thing once that is stuck in my head that basically said, um, for all the, the U.S. healthcare system's flaws, what the one thing it's really perfected is the emergency room or, you know, the late stage care, which is true. We sort of are in this emergency um, down or even downstream um, kind of frame of mind. But what we're talking about is more upstream as well as what Aaron, what you were talking about is we are going to see um, this shift toward using other healthcare professionals for some of these uh, primary care services is sort of where we seem to be gaining most traction, right? Like even pharmacists prescribing birth control um, is allowing them more of that authority to do so. Or like you said, using APRNs, um, using nurse practitioners, physician assistants to uh, allow them to do more. And, uh, you know, again, kind of what Hadley said, necessity is the mother of dimension on that. And I think COVID was definitely um, a flashlight on sort of that uh, need for that invention. So it was very interesting. Um, so I want to move us to some questions. Um, and again, to our audience, feel free to add them in the chat box. We will uh, go ahead and get started on some of those. 
Um, and so I will start with a question from Petra for Teresa. Um, for those pro-life people who are worried about the possible implantation uh, prevention mechanism of action by at least some types of birth control or emergency contraception, is there a good source or list of sources that you would point them to which shows this is likely not the case? Yes, great question. Go to secularprolife.org and under the tab stances, you'll see contraception. We've linked all the studies that uh, we've looked at and one of our co-leaders is she has her master's in some science something. So it's very sciencey and you'll be very impressed with the, the body of research that we've compiled um, on the issue. And it is a valid concern. I, I think that it's important to, for people to understand that, you know, it isn't just religious people being religious and crazy. Like there are real concerns that, uh, that uh, contra contraception can cause abortions, but we're, we feel very confident that that is not the case. And um, we're happy to present that information um, to spread the word. Great, so we also have a question from Bob who says in the international space, uh, faith leaders do support family plan planning programs, which include contraception. How can we engage U.S. faith leaders in these discussions? It's an interesting question. I don't know if anyone has any. <laughs> what did you say? The question. Yeah, I was having a little trouble hearing it. I was trying to read it real quick, and I exited out of Zoom. Oh, sorry. I'll repeat it. Um, in the international space, faith leaders do support family planning programs, which includes contraception. How can we engage U.S. faith leaders in these discussions on contraception, I imagine? I think you're going to be really hard pressed to get Catholics to, uh, to help you with this. Um, but, I, you know, I think with the other groups, it's just, you know, if if for some reason their denomination is okay with contraceptive, I think it's just the discussion of look what we're able to do to help them to create a life that uh, is better for them when they plan out. And, um, you know, I, I think the way to think about it too, and like, especially when I talk to like my fellow Catholics about it, um, you know, I, you can't say like change the way you think about contraceptive, like change the way you think through your faith, but, but apply it in a way where you're not compartmentalizing faith you're making a hard decision that you ultimately know will benefit the community and benefit the woman as a whole. And so, like I said in the beginning, like there's not a part of me that's gonna say what the church teaches is wrong or contraceptive. I'm, I'm not saying that at all. What I'm saying is a policymaker and someone who's trying to, to help, um, I'm choosing between two, two things, birth control and abortion. And to me, that's an easy choice about what I would rather see. An expansion of birth control versus an expansion of abortion and so i think if you can go to some faith leaders like i, I i'm a convert too so uh, i used to be a methodist and um with a weird stint in non-dom <laughs> um, but uh you know for those groups though um you know i think they're way more open to to contraceptive and i think that's how you phrase it is you know what's going to be better the traumatic event uh, uh and the costly events and the healthcare risks that come with the procedure like an abortion or an easy pill that they can take that, you know, hopefully one day will be over the counter and the choice is obvious. So. I think about the messenger. Like it has to come from someone who cares about the pro-life issue. Uh, if it's someone who is just completely opposed um, from their position on abortion, like they're just, they're just going to hear like, that you're completely on the other side from them. But if they believe that there is enough sameness and that there's enough of a commonality there, they're much more likely to consider it. Like we're both against, you know, the destruction of innocent human life. And yet I want to present to you the consideration that contraception doesn't intersect in that way. And I think that that's the best way to approach it. I can chime in here. I'm a Christian. I'm not a Catholic. I don't speak on behalf of Independent Women's Forum when I say this. I'm just sharing my personal opinion about engaging U.S. faith leaders and the discussion about contraception. And I think, uh, you know, there's, I think, an association uh, in some people's minds between birth control and sexual promiscuity. And we should remind people that many married couples use contraception 
in, um, in their marriages and their marriages might keep to the Christian sexual ethic. Um, and so that's one avenue where churches might simply be more frank about what happens in our families and um, how it's a part of, as Aaron said, it's part of community life that people have to engage in the marketplace for healthcare. And if this is a part of healthcare for you, um, there's actually another question. I don't know if we'll get to it or not. Birth control has other uses outside of contraceptive use. And so if we want to provide the best marketplace for people, including people of faith who might have a sexual ethic that um, really says, you know, there's certain uses for sex that are moral and some that are immoral, but contraception might be a part of, of the choices that they make. And if it is going to be a choice that they make, then the question becomes, what's the best public policy to um, make birth control most accessible and affordable for people who are going to make that choice? And I think I'm trying to remember the study that showed this, but basically of uh, women surveyed uh, by their relationship status, I believe married women were the largest percentage of uh, birth control users. Um, and of course, too, when the pill was first introduced, um, I may be getting this slightly wrong, but I, I think it was only four women who were married that were allowed to use the pill. So it was actually introduced, I think, as a method for, uh, for uh, married couples in family planning which is interesting. And yeah, Hadley to that question, which is next, so we'll get to it from Paria. Uh, birth control has other indications other than preventing pregnancy, very true. One of the main indications is to regulate menstrual cycles and polycystic ovarian syndrome. Do you think bringing awareness about this would decrease the stigma that comes with it and help increase access? Oh, definitely. And I think people need to know that. There's, it's amazing how much people don't know about birth control. Um, and, and running this legislation, it was kind of shocking almost. I mean, even among some women who just were completely unaware of it. So yeah, I think, I think the more education, the better, especially, you know, these off-brand uses or off-label uses, yeah. We have a question from Robert, are contraceptive methods generally considered less readily available to lower income families? Yeah, I think, I think that's widely understood that low income families do have accessibility issues for a wide range of healthcare issues, but I, I'm certain that birth control is one of them. And, um, and you know, like, Hadley said, the abortion industry is one of the, the main reasons why it is so regulated. Yeah, I think income is so often a proxy for other factors, right? Um, but one thing I would say is uh, a lot depends on your insurance status. If you're low income and you qualify for Medicaid, Medicaid covers a lot of contraceptive options from the first dollar. And so some low-income families might have that um, option at their disposal. Other low-income families who maybe don't have any type of health insurance coverage would have to pay for birth control out of pocket. And there are some discount programs that people can take advantage of. Even Walmart sells um, birth control for a pretty affordable price if you're willing to accept the, some of the cheaper forms, cheaper types of pills and so forth. So. Um, yeah, I mean, just like anything, if it costs uh, $30 a month, that's a bigger burden for a low-income family than it is for a family with a lot more resources at their disposal. So I think that's why we talk about the cost of birth control being a bigger burden for low-income families. I think, too, something about that paradigm is it's more rural versus urban. So representing a rural state like Arkansas, um, you know, yeah, I've got a lot of, lot of uh, low income people in rural areas, so they may say, well, they don't have access because they're, they're low income. Really, that's not it. Like, like Hadley said, I mean, they've got, you know, there's usually a Walmart in town, <laughs> uh, things like that, uh, and they can afford it, but they may not have a pharmacist in their county. I mean, I literally in the county I represent, my biggest county, I don't have a single pediatrician. So luckily I've got family practice doctors who take care of the kids and, you know, they can have access to that. But, but that's really the main thing is, can you actually find a place that, that sells it? Um, whereas, you know, in the cities, you know, like Northwest Arkansas or Little Rock, I mean, you, you, you've got, so even if you're low income, 
there's probably a chance you can hop a bus and go get some and then then go back to your house where if you live in the middle of rural Arkansas, you know, hopefully you got a car and you can drive. <laughs> so, but I, I see that as a bigger divide than income. Yeah, just the sheer accessibility in terms of provider, I think is what you're talking about, right? Um, that's a huge issue when it comes to some parts of the country. Yeah. What I'll say too, though, what's really nice is, you know, think about telemedicine in Arkansas that we just did on top of the contraceptive. You could literally get on a telemedicine visit with a pharmacist and then they could send you <laughs> birth control in the mail. So we've eliminated that, but we had to get two pieces of legislation to get that done. And I don't know anyone who's planning on setting up that business model, which I think is a pretty lucrative one, because, you know, if someone's looking for it, that's as long as they've got a mobile phone, they can get birth control shipped to their door. So, I mean, but that's, like I said, using innovation. I mean, those bill, bills pass, you know, with, with bipartisan support because it makes sense, so. We have a question from Scott. Um, hi, Scott. There was an application to make the pill over the counter. Does anyone know the status of that? Also, is the future of more over the counter contraception in federal or state? I'm glad that Courtney's got some background noise in her life. I've been waiting for my baby to start crying in the background here. So if that happens, you'll know, you'll know what my life is like. But um, no, I think the the future of over-the-counter contraception can be affected by both changes to federal and state law. So of course, the FDA regulates whether or not um, the pill can become available over the counter, or which types of pills. Well, there's different types of pills. There's a progestin only pill, there's the combined pill. Um, and then states like the state of Arkansas can pass legislation that, for example, allow pharmacists to prescribe, um, which changes the status uh, of birth control access. It improves it, in my view, um, because it increases the number of healthcare providers who can provide that prescription, but it doesn't move the pill all the way to over the counter. There's also an option to make types of birth control available behind the counter. This was the case for a while for uh, plan B or the morning after pill. And uh, Aaron mentioned vending machines earlier. So I just wanted to, to make this point. I think it's ironic that in some places, in some cases, you can get plan B out of a vending machine or you can get plan B at least behind the counter in some places over the counter. And we really ought to ask ourselves what that does to the incentives. And it kind of creates this distortion where in some cases it's easier to access plan B than it is plan A. And by plan A, I mean <laughs> the everyday pill that many women take. Um, so I would say we got to keep our eye on the ball in terms of um, how we're incentivizing people's behaviors and certainly birth control policy can affect that. But I commend state lawmakers uh, like Aaron who have made changes to make birth control access um, more ready, readily available even though the FDA ultimately um, has restricted our um, ability to move it completely over the counter. That's still the case. And to Scott's question, um, I do believe that the over-the-counter application is still in the works. My understanding was that it takes several years basically for the manufacturer who was applying to basically jump through all the hoops um, that the FDA has put in place to ensure that the product is safe enough for over-the-counter access. Um, and I apologize for the, uh, the loud disruption the mailman got here right on time. Um, and so that is the highlight of our dog's day. Um, so real quick, I want to throw out uh, one more question. Teresa, do you worry that making contraceptives over the counter uh, undermines the contraception mandate in the Affordable Care Act? This was an issue that Democrats did not want to engage on because some thought that it did. I don't know if anyone has thoughts on that as well. This is a very, very touchy subject and I'm not really prepared to speak on it, um, but I know that it is really sensitive and controversial. So I will acknowledge that it is and say that I am not prepared to speak on behalf of that for secular pro life. Adley or Aaron, I just wanna let y'all, in case you wanna jump in on that. What was the question again? I'm sorry, my wife texted me and I got distracted. <laughs> okay, um, work from home life, right? Uh, so yeah. do you worry that making uh, birth control over the counter undermines the contraception mandate in the Affordable Care Act? So basically Democrats didn't want to engage on that because they thought that that would happen. You know, it's so funny. So like it's coming from a Republican. I, 
I never thought we were undermining it. I just was like, I just want to get more people access. Uh, maybe I'm just too earnest, but um, you know, if, if they feel that way, I'd say it's almost kind of like a little paranoid thinking because we're not, you know, we're pushing in my, my colleagues on the, on the right who were behind me. This was all about just, you know, we want to expand access. It makes sense. Let's deregulate it. We, we always talk about cutting red tape. Here's some red tape. Let's cut it. So um, that's, that's kind of interesting, but no. Um, I don't. I don't think it does. Um. I mean, to to Aaron's point, I think that um, you can have these two policies side by side, right? You can keep the contraception mandate in the Affordable Care Act in place, and also make um, more forms of contraception available over the counter. I've already spoken my piece about you know how I think that the contraception mandate uh, ultimately does more harm than good. It's I think a well-intended policy that has resulted in higher costs that ultimately get passed along to women and men in our health insurance premiums. It's not as if the government declaring that something is free makes it free. It simply changes the way that we pay for it. In some cases, changes the way that we pay for it and makes the thing more expensive. <laughs> and that's the case with this with this particular mandate. Excellent. Well, I want to thank everyone so much for being here uh, to Hadley and Teresa and Aaron. Thank you guys so much for your time and for your insight. Um, always a fascinating topic. Always love to hear from you all on this issue. So thank you everyone for joining us and uh, until next time. Bye. Yeah. Thank you.